Stonehenge to the Grand Canyon. There are thousands of sights that will leave you in awe. Beautiful Planet is a series that will take a closer look into these wonders of the world. Join us on Cayman 27, Mondays at 7 p.m. and Saturdays at 10.30 p.m. to witness this beautiful planet. The world is getting smaller. We travel more. We see more. We do more. So you need a bigger health plan like Premier Health. You have easy access to benefits at home. One million U.S. providers accept your ID card for college, vacation, and business travel. With 24-7 worldwide assistance, U.S. pharmacy benefits, and 96% of claims settled in five days, Premier Health offers you the care you deserve. Brit K, where people come first. BritK.ky If it matters to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the President and Council of the Chamber of Commerce, I welcome you all to Sir John A. Cumber Primary School for the West Bay West Candidates Forum, the sixth of 19 forums of the 2017 election year. I am Paul Pearson, the immediate past president of the Chamber, and I will be serving as the facilitator this evening. When the Chamber was established in 1965, the goal was to create an institution that supports promotes and protects the interests and welfare of its members and of course the wider community in general also. Being nonpartisan, we have hosted forums every election year since 1988. For eight elections, we have provided members of the community with an opportunity to meet their candidates and educate themselves before election day. The Chamber of Commerce has prioritized education as the key focus for 2017 and the foreseeable future. And these forums are just one of the many efforts we will use to focus on education. Another public educational campaign that you will be seeing much more of over the coming weeks and months is our Growth Matters initiative. This initiative is a series of 10 animated educational and fun videos on the importance of economic growth and how it is achieved. The videos are available online at growthmatters.ky and through social media. And we will also be taking the videos into all high schools to encourage discussion among the Cayman youth. The Chamber thanks you for your support on this and all our initiatives, including tonight's. And tonight is about West Bay West. We recently distributed an election survey to the Chamber membership, from which we have developed a series of national and con constituency questions. We have also invited and accepted questions from the public and you are welcome to submit your own this evening for review. If you do wish to submit a question this evening, please ensure that it is directed at all of the candidates. Personal questions directed at single candidates will not be permitted. These forums have taken weeks of preparation and we are pleased to be here tonight for your district. We hope that this opportunity to meet your candidates here tonight will prove beneficial to you. I would like to extend a wholehearted thanks to Hurley's Media for their support and assistance in broadcasting these forums live on Cayman 27 and online. With their help, we will have ensured that all members of the community can hear from their candidates. I would also like to thank the DART organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holdings and Puritan Cleaners for their support. And last, but certainly not least, the Chamber staff for their hard work in organizing these events. The moderator for this evening is Mr. Will Pinot, Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber. He will now explain the rules for tonight's forum and will introduce the candidates. Will. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, candidates. Good evening. Let me explain the rules for this evening's forum. Each candidate will be asked a series of questions prepared by chamber members and the general public. Candidates will have two minutes to elaborate on each question if you choose to do so. One ring will indicate that you have 30 seconds to conclude your response. Two rings means that your response time has expired. Each candidate will be allowed to answer the question without interruption from any of the other candidates and is free to differ with an opinion or position of a fellow candidate 
during their allotted response time. The order of tonight's questioning has been done democratically and that we had a, a drawing as to who would get the first, second, and third question. Candidates should deal solely with the issues. No personal attacks of any kind will be tolerated. And at the conclusion of question time, we will ask, uh, we will ask questions from our audience. And again, I ask the audience to direct your questions to all the candidates. And at the conclusion of the forum, each candidate will be allowed two minutes to deliver a closing statement. I will introduce this evening's candidates right after this short commercial break. Please stay tuned. This is the Progressive Lunch. Alden speaking, Marco speaking, Maxine Mosley and Pantan speaking. One big meeting, one big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going, come out, progressive lunch, come out, progressive lunch, come out, progressive lunch. Everybody going, come out, progressive lunch, come out, progressive lunch, come out, progressive lunch. Everybody going, come out. Alden speaking, Marco speaking, Maxine Mosley and Pantan speaking. One big meeting, one big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going, come out, progressive lunch, come out, progressive lunch, come out, progressive lunch. Everybody going, come out, progressive lunch, come out, progressive lunch, come out. Progressive lunch. This is the progressive lunch. Progressive lunch. Progressive lunch. Progressive lunch. This is the progressive lunch. One big meeting. One big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out. Progressive lunch. If you're looking for extra savings and free benefits with car insurance and home insurance, Brit K has just the cover you need. There's a free $250 gift voucher for new home insurance customers, too, and 10% car insurance discount if you have home insurance. With a claim service that's quick and friendly, we call it Cover Without Added Costs. Call for a quote on 949-8699 or visit BritK.ky. Brit K, where people come first. Waste Carriers is your complete waste management company. We service commercial, residential, and construction properties. With our large inventory of dumpsters and grapple truck services, we provide an unmatched, dependable service. Our sister company, Island Recycling, buys and collects recyclables such as AC units, aluminum cans, auto batteries, copper, and much, much more. For Cayman's Waste and Recycling Solution, one call takes care of it all. Call 946-DUMP. That's 946-3867. Welcome back to the Sir John A. Cumber Primary School in West Bay, where in West Bay West, there are 1,238 voters in this electoral district, and we are lucky to have, or we're pleased to have, three of the candidates, or three, the three candidates in this year's election for West Bay West. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce each one of them. We'll begin with W. McKeever Bush. Mr. Bush has served in the Legislative Assembly for over 32 years and is currently serving as the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. He has represented the District of West Bay since 1984 and is currently the longest serving member in the Legislative Assembly. Mr. Bush is seeking re-election as a Cayman Democratic Party candidate for West Bay. Welcome, Mr. Bush. Daphne Arrett served in the Legislative Assembly as the third elected member for West Bay from 1988 to 1992, and has also served as an Executive Chief Officer in the Health Services Department, as Secretary to the Judge of the Grand Court, to the Treasury Department, and to the Administrator, Sir John A. Cumber. Ms. Arrett is seeking election as a progressive candidate for West Bay. Welcome, Ms. Arrett. Mr. Paul Rivers is an entrepreneur and business owner having established his own company, Spirit of the West, in 2005. Mr. Rivers is a seventh generation Caymanian who has used his business to provide employment opportunities for young Caymanians, as well as providing them with mentorship. Mr. Rivers is seeking election as an independent candidate for West Bay. Welcome, Mr. Rivers. Thank you, Will, and thank you to the audience for coming out. And, and, thank, and thank God for being here today. I now turn over to Mr. Paul Pearson, who will 
start asking the questions in order of the random selection. Um, as Will mentioned, we had a random selection earlier on, and uh, Mr. Bush has received the first question with Mr. Rivers, this, um, the same question, and then Mr. Red. After that, we will take turns asking um, the question on who, the first question. So, Mr. Bush, over to you. Explain why you have decided to run for election in 2017, and why should West Bay West voters support you as their candidate of choice? Thank you. I have been elected, fortunate to have been elected by the district, entire district of West Bay for 32 plus years. But I've been involved in the community for much longer than that. As a Sunday school teacher, as a boy scouts and cub scouts and boys brigade leader, a young people's group leader, and various other community organizations. I know my community. I think I have done well for it over the past 32 years. It's a changing community like the rest of our island. And I believe that I still have the skill. I do know that I care about people and that is what is important to me. It's about caring for the people. I believe that I am qualified to represent the people for more years. And Ms. Rivers, to you the same question. Explain why you have decided to run for election in 2017 and why should West Bay West voters support you as their candidate of choice? Good evening, audience. Good evening, television viewers. Good evening to all you out in Radio Land. And once again, thank Almighty God for giving us the peace amongst us, the courage and the strength to go and continue a new election. Why I'm running in this election is a very simple reason. For over three decades, I've recognized that West Bay and West Bay Road has had more development in it than all three islands combined. I've come to realize that we have had people in position longer and stronger, meaning in a place of authority longer than any other district. I've also come to realize that more of our people lean harder on the social services budget because of being left out. All this is due, in my opinion, to political manipulation. So why I'm here is to change all of that. Change is in the hands of everyone. And I'm fitting for the job because I'm not <coughs> afraid to take the, the task on. Not saying that there hadn't been good things done in the past the West Bay. If I said that, I would be telling a lie. And I'm not here to lie. I'm here to be a thousand percent truthful to West Bay West, West Bay in its entire district, and to all three of the Cayman Islands. So what makes me a fitting candidate? I have the courage, the vision, the strength, the youth, and I bring new things to the table to enhance all our lives, not just West Bay West, West Bay in its totality, and the Cayman Islands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Ms. Arrett, the same question to yourself. Please explain why you have decided to run for election in 2017, and why should West Bay West voters support you as their candidate of choice? Press the button. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, my name is Daphne Auret, and I am running uh, in this election to seek the seat representing the constituency of West Bay West. This is the area in which I was born and bred, and I spent most of my life in, in that location. I've been a former member of the Legislative Assembly, I made a very worthwhile contribution while I was there. There have been many areas on which I touched. Uh, many of those I intended to pursue when I uh, did not reg regain my seat in, 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 as a member of the House. Why am I running for this seat? 
because I feel that the time is now, at this moment in our history, this is when I need to be here. I care for the community of West Bay and every single citizen who has lived in this country understands that that is a fact. I love God, I love people. Secondly, the type of representation which I think West Bay deserves, we have not had for a long time. And in this election, I'm hoping to win the seat for the constituency of West Bay West and to sit as a member of the Legislative Assembly, a role for which I am fully qualified. Thank you, Mr. Ed. Um, next question. The next question will go to Mr. Rivers first. What do, you con what do you consider to be the top issue facing residents in West Bay West? And what would you do to address it if elected? The top issues facing West Bay West is what is facing West Bay in, its in, to in totality and the country as a whole. Hopelessness, unemployment, crime, and general political manipulation. In order to address these issues, we first have to let people believe in themselves, show them that they're worth something, let them have a desire, let them chase the Cayman dream that myself and other successful Caymanians have chased and have accomplished. Just a brief example of how I will be willing and able and a plan of mine to get our people engaged in chasing the Cayman dream. For an example, I'm pro-development, but I'm all for the people because it doesn't make any sense to have development if our people are left behind. For example, a developer comes and makes a proposal to build a hotel. In that development plan, in his business model, it has to be incorporated where our people fit in and their continuous success. For example, when the hotel starts, the training and upskilling also starts from the selected pool of applicants in our community. So when the hotel finishes, our people are smiling and opening the doors and sharing the genuine hospitality that came on people how built the tourism industry on. That's what I'm about placing people in the right position, not turning my back, not making excuses, not afraid to knock on doors and hold those accountable who should be held accountable and erasing all forms and sorts and indications of political manipulation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. <clears throat> Mr. Red, the same question to yourself. What do you consider to be the top issue facing residents in the West Bay West constituency, and what would you do to address it if elected? There are quite a number of issues actually that need attention. Some are more urgent than others. One of the things I like about the one man, one, or one person, one vote system is that each individual, or the individual, who's successful in gaining a seat in each of the constituencies will be responsible and at the end of four years is going to be held accountable. It can no longer be I couldn't get things done because thus and so did not assist me. In West Bay West, certainly I want to do everything I can and I think God has given me good health, a very sharp mental capacity, a strong and steady emotional stability, honesty, integrity, competence, 
experience, maturity, and many other factors which are key qualifications when one is looking for a seat in the Legislative Assembly. I would like to do everything I possibly can to see that we save this generation, that West Bay is returned to its former glory, that we do not see areas in this district where individuals actually live in squalor, and money is wasted in so many areas which should be placed in the more needy sections of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arendt. Mr. Bush, same question to yourself. What do you consider to be the top issue facing residents in the West Bay West constituency, and what would you do to address it if elected? <coughs> Thank you. Our problems are the same as any other district in this country today. Lack of commitment by the government to our people. People are losing their homes, their businesses, their vehicles, and their investments, perhaps in a small piece of property. We intend to address them and our plans are laid out in our manifesto, and I wish you would give me time to, to read those. But we do have a plan. Government has to, has to address the matter of people losing their mortgages. That's, it is, the truth is not being told, and far too many people are losing their homes. And we are going to put forward a plan where government will have to come up with some upfront money to address the worst case scenarios and we are going to then after that work with the, the banks, the financial institutions, to a restructuring of mortgages to ensure that people are not losing their homes for the want of, after paying for 15 years, for the want of $5,000 or $8,000. It's a disgrace, it's a shame, it's a practical rape of our community when that is happening. And the general melee in this community, as I said, exists in other communities. People are sleeping in their cars. People can't pay their, their rent. So there are plans. We have to also start a community development program. The problems that exist in the country exist in the community. And the silos built up in Georgetown are not meeting the problems that are facing in our communities. Crime, uh, the, 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 as I said, all the other matters that come with that, lack of jobs, they are not being met. So we will do something about it in first 10 to 100 days. Thank you, Mr. Bush. <clears throat> Ms. Arette, the this question is um, aimed at yourself first. What are your ideas to increase economic development in West Bay West? Could you repeat that question, please? Sure. What are your ideas to increase economic development in West Bay West? Well, as a starter, you work with individuals to get things done. I'm, I'm in this uh, race as a member of the Progressives Party. I don't need to remind everyone but there are some who may need to be reminded that in the past four years, promises made by the Progressives Party has in many ways, or have in many ways, been brought to fruition. Every time an election is held, every candidate making their promises. For instance, in 1980, one of the key issues on the manifesto was the police station. That would be a priority. It remains the same as it was then, and that's a long time ago. Our roads, for the most part, are deplorable. We've had patch and seal and patch and seal. 
those are things. However, I mentioned a bit earlier that I want to see this generation saved. I want to see every single individual district take it upon themselves the responsibility that they are going to help in some way to save the generation. I remember as a child, there's a community just down the road, it's called Logwoods. My grandmother took me there to pick up straw work from a lady by the name Precious Memory, Miss Daisy. It was a nice community, clean, nice people, friendly. It's been called the crime capital of West Bay. I expect that in four years after I'm there, in less than that, it'll be called the new Logwoods. Thank and you, Mr. every Ryan. child who is living there will be proud to say, this is where I live. Same, que same question to you, Mr. Rivers. What are your ideas to increase economic development in West Bay West? Thanks for the question. Some of my ideas to increase economic opportunity in West Bay West is to go around my district and solicit the companies who are already existing in West Bay West, scrutinize their employment capacity, look at what skills are necessary, speak to management, and solicit jobs for my constituency by physically going in with them and lining them up with job opportunities so they can have a stable income to provide for their families. Also, a certain part of our district in West Bay West, the Hell Road area is highly traversed um, by tourism, tour buses, tourism operations. Serious corner there that needs to be enhanced That'll be one of the first things I'll be looking at because I've seen many of dangerous um, situations there where people have actually got hurt and that, that situation needs to be remedied. It's been neglected way, way too long. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the next topic we have is, is, I guess, a general West Bay topic. It's um, based on the Cayman Turtle Center. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Bush. The same question for you. Yes. What, what is to increase economic development? As a, thank you. As a community, um, economic development is, is difficult for the area of West Bay West, except for some apartments. And if you look at it, and we are looking at a, very, a plan for the, um, how to improve health. Uh, the whole health and there's basically several businesses there two different let's say two or three different properties but it's difficult because of how we are situated but uh, butting and binding uh, West Bay West, West Bay North which is, is on the, the, the beachfront has some apartments and some are already slated to go in West Bay uh, North and as I said, it, it is no good us sitting here saying what can't be. We've got to look at what, what the possibilities are. And uh, as I said, I mean, separate and apart from a craft market that we believe that can be utilized at, and, and not just craft, but vegetables and, and food kind, can be situated over in where the, the launching ramp is now. In, in West Bay, uh, where we plan to do some of that, there's not a whole lot that can be done in West Bay, sent, uh, West as it stands. Community development is a complete different thing. There's many things that can be done. There are already two areas that I know, and you could probably look for more, but two areas that can be used as parks. Well, thank the candidates. We've gone through three questions. Do you, do you want to continue? Yeah. Okay. 30 seconds. When it comes to the time, we, we know that there needs to be some improvement. Thank God that children don't go there anymore. But the, the post office, 
when we came to do the post office, I had a choice. Do I do what the other, the other districts had done, spend a million dollars to build this big, huge post office? I said, no. We took $300,000, $400,000 and fixed up the present post office, and it is workable and all, I think, practically, that we need as a district. Thank you, Mr. gone through the first three questions. We're going to take a short commercial break and we'll return right after that. Many women have a hard time talking about their gynecological health, but poor gynecological health can lead to many other issues. Here are some tips. Practice safe sex. Work out regularly. Practice your Kegel exercises. These are exercises that can improve the tone of the muscles in the pelvic area. And be sure to visit your gynecologist annually for an exam and recommended screenings that can identify any potential issues early. Visit the local Cayman Islands office at Governor Square or call 749-3304. Has he nicked it? Yes, he has. What a repulse from Jason. Homeboy, hold up. That should be taken. Caught. Missed. This is the progressive launch. Alden speaking, Marco speaking, Maxine Mosley and Pantan speaking. One big meeting, one big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out. Alden speaking, Marco speaking, Maxine Mosley and Pantan speaking. One big meeting, one big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out. Lunch. This is the progressive lunch. Progressive lunch. Progressive lunch. Progressive lunch. This is the progressive lunch. One big meeting. One big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out. Progressive lunch. Welcome back to the John A. Cumber Primary School in West Bay. We have three of the candidates for West Bay West, and we've gone through the first three questions. The next question, now the fourth question, we'll start with Mr. Bush. So now, now let's get on to the campaign center. Mr. Bush, how would you say in research, education, and conservation? I'm, I'm sorry, you'll have to repeat that. Sure. How would you support the mission of the Cayman Turtle Center to broaden its efforts in research, education, and conservation? I, I believe over the years that the Cayman Turtle Farm has done a great job in con conserving turtles, release thousands into the wild. I do recognize that there is an element internationally, or basically, yes, internationally, that... that has opposed that, in fact, has opposed our turtle farm. It's a long story in regards to the turtle farm, and we have done everything in the world to have complied internationally to make that what they wanted, what the various organizations wanted, they still turned us down. We have bred in captivity, and which that was required, they opposed that. The education aspect of the Cayman Turtle Farm, I think, has been improved. And I don't know how much more that can be done. Yes, every business, and that is a business, the turtle farm itself, um, has hiccups here and there and, and mishaps. You're dealing with humans who are dealing with animals. But I think the management has done tremendously well. That I can sit here and say that I can add much to it except to work with management as a government, that's what we would do to improve and where we can satisfy international rep 
patients more than we have, we will certainly be willing to do that, but we have to be pushed as a government into stopping the turtle farm as we know it. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Mr. Rivers, over to you. How would you support the mission of the Cayman Turtle Center to broaden its efforts in research, education, and conservation? First, I would seek some private partnership with the Cayman Turtle Farm to enhance its efforts in research and education because presently, though I do agree that the Turtle Farm has played a very integral role in the tourism development of the Cayman Islands and has offered many, many of our people jobs. I mean, it's been a great thing. The old turtle farm did make a real profit. The new turtle farm has become a lean on, on, on government. But however, I was saying that I would not turn it away. I would seek private partnership to incorporate what we have there and advance our efforts in, you know, bringing turtle farm to a new level. I would also increase the awareness and the history of the Cayman Turtle Farm to what turtling meant to our people, how we made a life on the high seas, the, the historical value alone that it places on the Cayman Islands, not only in West Island, but in the Cayman Islands. Also, it wouldn't hurt in seeking um, private partnership to solicit to some of the two companies who already make a, a good business of bringing tourists there um, to donate to the cause because without the turtle farm, tourism will be rather bleak in our district and rather bleak in the country as a whole. So there are just a few ideas right off the bat that I would have to, to enhance the efforts of advancing the Cayman turtle farm. Again, it has played a very integral role in development of this district, but as our island as a whole, as a country on a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Ms. Oret, same question. How would you support the mission of the Cayman Turtle Center to broaden its efforts in research, education, and conservation? I think over the years, actually, as far as research is concerned, the turtle farm has, uh, I think, made uh, great strides in, in that area. Are there things left to do? I do believe that. Um, as far as the conservation, what we need to understand is uh, the turtling and the turtle population in Cayman is something very special to us. It, it's, we, we, we never want to know that we, it wasn't there. We always, uh, the men fish for turtle, far off in the, in the Central American Keys and so on. But here in Cayman, it's something very special. The one thing I'd like to say though, and I have a, something here that I'd like the audience to see. For the turtle farm to make strides, whether that's in research, conservation, or in any other area, here we had an entity which was making a profit for many years the former government decided that they could do a better job. That's no longer the case. Since that farm opened, we have been, it started off, we were paying $10 million, million a year. I need to show you something, sir. I may have to give up some of my other, the rest of my time to show you this, but I want, the audience to see what $10 million looks like. And year after year after year, that's what we spend. Well, you have 10 seconds. <laughs> so $10 million, there you go. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, Mr. Ren. <laughs> so candidates. $10 million so a candidates. year. So candidates. 
in debt. I would ask. And we can't excuse, excuse pay me. down the debt excuse, until this present excuse moment. Me. Put a government in excuse who me. knows what they're doing. Ms. Orette, <laughs> we have limited amount of times, and out of courtesy to your voters and the audience, Thank you. We want to get as many questions in this evening. We can only do that with your cooperation. Thank you. Next question. Okay. So, candidates, chamber members have identified education and crime amongst the top national issues in this year's election. So we'll start with education. And this question goes to Mr. Rivers first. What do you think needs to be done to improve the quality of education within the Cayman Islands? Thank you for the question. To, to improve the quality of education in the Cayman Islands, one of the main steps should be that we have educators formulating curriculum and policy in schools. When we come before the country as candidates and we get selected and we become MLAs or ministers, that does not qualify us to be a professional in any capacity, whether it's education, finance, whatever, the, whatever it is, whatever the portfolio is. If we put education back in the hands of qualified educators, and I've looked at the history of education in the Cayman Islands in terms of all ministers except one, Mr. Roy Borden, was a qualified educator. We have many highly qualified individuals who have became education ministers, including the present education minister today, is probably one of the highest qualified. But being an educator gives you insight and direction on how to address all the problems that arise in education. Would you like for me to go on about the crime? You said it's a two-part no, question? No, no, that was the question. Crime okay. is next. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. <clears throat> Ms. Orette, that we're going to you next. What do you think needs to be done to improve the quality of education within the Cayman Islands? The educational process is an ongoing process. We, every government needs to look for ways in which to enhance and improve the educational opportunities for our children. If there's ever one thing that um, parents are concerned about, it's the education of their children. Um, very nice buildings is fine. And people and children need to be able to study in, uh, in an environment which is conducive to learning. So, that aside, the teachers that we employ are very, very important. One of the things that I would hope to see, and I make no bones about this, teachers are in, in individuals who their work does not end at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the school is normally dismissed. They carry on that work, sometimes many hours afterwards. We need to put salaries for teachers uh, to a level which is, which is attractive. We also need to understand that here in West Bay, we have a school that's very, very much um, overcrowded. There are more children than we have space for. When we had an opportunity, to change that, we didn't. What I am saying right now is that this present government, if one looks at what has taken place over the last four years, and they have a report card, a four-year report card, the progressives, and if you would look into that, you will see where many <coughs> improvements have been done as regards education, and I'm sure their intention is to continue that. Thank you, Ms. Arette. <laughs> Mr. Bush, what do you think needs to be done to improve the quality of education within the Cayman Islands? 
Our schools have produced over the years, I consider, some good scholars and professionals for the country. For a small island with limited resources, we must be proud of the schools we have, even done by very trying circumstances. However, our education system, as it is, have deemed to fail far too many students. We must acknowledge this and reorganize our schools for success. And so our government will give principals budgetary control for their schools, and we will ensure that principals have a stronger voice in the recruitment and dismissal of any teacher at their school. We will ensure that the ministry establishes whole school targets which the principals will be held accountable for. And when we come with the children, every child will have a formally documented education plan for each academic year, which will be signed off by the children, their parents or guardians, their teacher or tutor, and the principal. We will have a learning support team. will be established with all relevant stakeholders. We will, every family placed on the educational at risk register will be monitored by the school and an annual report filed with the minister to ensure that corrective action is taken. And so even for our children with extreme behavioral and emotional issues, we must roll out programs geared specifically to them. And under the previous Minister of Education, Mr. Michael Miles was brought in to um, advocate and link critically for students. But we must have commitment for our teachers. We cannot continue and believe that we can continue to castigate and tear down teachers in front of our children and expect them to be successful. So we have to create a best practice approach to recruiting the very best teachers. We have to honor the teaching profession by real pay and community, community recognition. I could go on. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bush. So sticking with the, the topic of education, we have another question um, from our membership. And this one will go to Ms. Arette first. Would you support a public-private partnership in the management and oversight of the public school system? It is something which I think um, the government should look into. I think it's a subject that would certainly have to be um, The parents have to be involved. I don't think that any government should simply say, this is what we're going to do. Uh, but what I can say is that there is something which causes concern in that for one reason or another, individuals, many people believe that there's something wrong with the government's education system as compared with private schools. Now one of the things that each of us need to understand is that in private schools they can determine who comes, who attends their school. If a child has problems and they call that parent in and say we're going to have to release your, ch your child, we, we cannot cope with this type of behavior, they can do so. In the public school that's a different matter. You can't just say, well, listen, we're going to, this child has to be expelled or dismissed or whatever. So we may need to take a serious look and see what areas we might be able to make a positive change so that uh, in, in a public-private partnership, would it be okay for government to say, listen, it's costing us 10 or 15,000 a year, for child, for us to educate that child, we will, we will make a contribution to a private school and a parent will pick up on, on, the, on the rest of the tuition fees. There, there are many things to look at. Um, quite frankly, two minutes is kind of short to explain all the, the different areas in this regard because education is very, very important to all of us. Thank you, Ms. Arendt. So, Mr. Bush, that question is to you now. Would, 
Would you support a public-private partnership in the management and oversight of the public school system? As I said earlier, we have come a long way from where we were with education, from where I was when we were students and, and were not given opportunities. Today, people do have opportunities. There are good private schools. There are good government schools. I think, and we will propose, a game-changing approach to the management of schools. We do, I do believe in public-private sector partnership, and I believe that we can do so in education, bearing in mind that we are not going to leave out any child. It's not going to be any elitist group. But I believe that we can have a partnership with private sector. There are scores of good plans, good examples, scores of people internationally, people locally, that can make it happen. We are committed to the private school because government is already assisting private schools. They're not new, and we believe it's the right thing to do. I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Mr. Rivers, this one is to you, uh, the same question again. Would you support a public-private partnership in the management and oversight of the public school system? I certainly will. In order for any community or any society to elevate, we must first educate. In order to educate properly, we have to have an environment conducive to learning. In recent years, our schools, especially the private schools, have been overburdened by population increase that has kind of sort of overnight been forced upon us. We need to treat education like a business to make a success of it. It's far cheaper to invest in our children now in the foundation years of their life than to try to rehabilitate them once they go astray and wind up in an institution like Northwood Prison or incarcerated anywhere else around the world. It's cheaper to, to educate them now it will develop life skills, it will build a better community, it will build an overall better country. So it's far cheaper now. Certainly, I will endorse and promote and support public-private partnership in education, because education in anyone's life is prerequisite. When you have education, you make educated decisions. That saves you as an individual from going astray. That saves a country from going down the drain. If you doubt me, look around our district, look around our island, look around our country. Look at, the, look at countries without economy and tell me how educated or how lack of education that they have. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Well, thank you very much. We've gone through six questions. When we come back, we'll turn to the subject of crime right after this message. So we've already talked about what economic growth means and why it's so important. But how do we achieve economic growth? Well, remember the three tiers of the Cayman Islands economy? In a way, each tier is like a separate economy in its own right. They each have different growth drivers and different obstacles to growth. So let's look at each tier and see how we can help them grow. Let's start with tier three. Remember, Tier 3 is made up of all the companies that sell products and services to the residents of the Cayman Islands, like Foster's, Kirk's, Hurley's, Scott's Marine, Ale Thompson's, Cox Lumber, Champion House, Alakabab, and so on. So how can we help these companies grow? Let's look at a great example of a Tier 3 company, a hairdressing salon. To increase revenue, the hair salon could spend more money on marketing and win customers that way. More customers means more revenue, right? Right. However, that's not economic growth. Because although more customers would mean more revenue, that's only because another salon's revenue went down. If you could look at the hairdressing sector as a whole, the overall revenue or demand stayed exactly the same. Even if an entrepreneur came along and opened a new salon, that wouldn't be economic growth either. Because again, Demand for hairdressing hasn't changed. That doesn't mean having more salons is a bad thing, but it's not economic growth. So the question is really, what would have to happen to increase demand for hairdressing? 
Well, two things. First, disposable incomes could go up. Disposable income is what people have left over after they've paid for important things like housing and food. When disposable income goes up, people have more money to spend on things like hairdressing. When disposable income goes down, like during a recession, people look for ways to cut back on spending, so they visit hair salons less often. And what could cause disposable income to increase? You guessed it, economic growth. The second way to increase demand would be to increase the population. More people means more customers buying more products and services from tier three businesses like hairdressers. So in that way, population growth actually helps our tier three businesses. Now, not everyone agrees that population growth is a good thing, and that's fine. But because population growth is both a cause and result of economic growth, trying to grow the economy without growing the population is like standing in a bucket and trying to lift yourself up by the handle. It's not gonna get you anywhere. In the next video, we'll look at how tier two companies fit into the economy and how to help them grow. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine. This is the progressive launch. Alden speaking, Marco speaking, Maxine Mosley and Pantan speaking. One big meeting, one big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out. Alden speaking, Marco speaking, Maxine Mosley and Pantan speaking. One big meeting, one big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out. Progressive launch. This is the progressive launch. Progressive launch. Progressive launch. Progressive launch. This is the progressive launch. One big meeting. One big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out. Progressive launch. Looking for quality products with the best prices? Then come to Uncle Bill's. We carry the best bicycle brands on island. You can also make a custom order and pick up items from our great line of accessories. We have a fantastic range of stainless steel, gas, and charcoal grills. And make sure to check out our great line of DeWalt power tools. Plus our newest product, the FlexVolt. Have the freedom of cordless. Come and visit us today, Uncle Bill's Home Improvement Center. Have you had your Tortuga moment today? Come by Tortuga Fine Wine and Spirits for all your liquor needs and taste the world famous Tortuga rum and rum cake. Baked fresh daily in the Cayman Islands. Enchanting, exotic and always delicious. Like the moments you share and will savor forever. The taste of the Cayman Islands, remembering the time of your life over and over again. Such sweet surrender. If it matters to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Welcome back to the Sir John A. Cumber Primary School in West Bay. We're with the three candidates for West Bay West, McKeever Bush, Daphne Arrett, and Paul Rivers. We now move on to the subject of crime. I turn it over to Paul Pearson for the questions. As Will said, we're on the, the subject of crime now, and the first question um, goes to yourself, Mr. Bush. It has been suggested that we allow police and security guards who are licensed and trained to carry firearms on the job. Do you support this suggestion? I don't know why Chamber chose to put the question that way because there is so much about crime that guns are not the not element, as far as I'm concerned, to deal with it, yes, in some instances, but not the entire aspect of what is happening on crime. Every day now, there is some place robbed every day. And there have to be, must be, new processes, more different procedures to deal 
with the, the crime that is creeping up on us, um, human trafficking, drugs, robberies, illegal immigration, weapon smuggling, the very police station, robbed three times. We don't know how many drugs, what it was, where they went. So there are a, a lot of issues to deal with crime. Our borders need protecting better than that exists. Because we, we have a boat that is what I call a North Sound boat. Uh, the, the rescue boat needs rescuing. But we intend to develop policies to support the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service in the achievement of its objectives to uphold the law fairly and firmly to prevent and detect crime to pursue and bring to justice those who break the law irrespective of their status to keep the peace and, and to protect help and reassure the community with integrity sound judgment and common sense we will work with our partners in the United Kingdom the United States of America and within our region to augment and develop an effective border control program with the requisite equipment and supplies for technical and logistical support to enhance the protection of our borders and stem the importation and infiltration of illegal weapons, one. But we will also work with the governor and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to develop a national defense service to help protect our borders and to be called upon in times of impending national disasters to also assist the Royal Cayman Islands Police in their mandate to maintain public order when required. We do need more patrols and, and I think ma better management of what resources we have. We are putting millions of dollars into it. But I do believe and I must say that the present commissioner is on a good track right now. Thank you, Mr. Bush. The same question to yourself, Mr. Rivers. It has been suggested that we allow police and security guards who are licensed and trained to carry firearms on the job. Do you support this suggestion? I don't support the suggestion. Many of our police have come from jurisdictions and environments where the gun culture is high, and to murder someone, whether justifiable or not, in action, of, of, in line of duty or not, is just a simple thing. They're desensitized to that kind of environment. That's not an environment that we used to, and we should encourage it to begin with. The best way to eliminate and handle crime is have a crime prevention strategy. Yeah. Crime prevention strategies, in my mind, is creating job opportunities for your people so people have more. They don't have to rob someone else for a slice of bread. They have what you have. Supporting and endorsing and creating the Cayman dream and showing everyone that it can be achieved. Building desire in your youth, not using excuses and, and political manipulation to exist in a system that is eating us. Here's a case in point. Many of, many of you in the audience, many of you in television land have mortgaged your homes and your businesses to get your children educated, yet to come back and doors shut in their face to say that they're overqualified or they don't have any experience. How can someone have experience if they can't get a job to begin with? So a crime prevention strategy enhancing employment opportunities for our youth and our, our doesn't necessarily have to be youth, our citizens in general is the best way to combat crime. In terms of policing, hire more local police who know the geographical layout. I've witnessed a crime happen and someone reported it and the police had not a clue of our district how to reprimand the perpetrator. Hire more and train more Cayman police. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Ms. Oret, the same question to you. It has been suggested that we allow police and security guards who are licensed and trained to carry firearms on the job. Do you support this suggestion? There's been men, much um, conversation and concern about this. Um, what do we, what, how do you combat crime which, for the most part, is carried out 
either threatening with a firearm or some form of weapon. Of course, the firearm is the one that we're concerned about at this moment. What the Progressives government is suggesting, planning to do, it's not an easy uh, quick fix. They want to create a national Coast Guard with the assistance, expertise, and funding of the UK. Convert the RCIPS Marine Unit into a national Coast Guard with the ability to detect and interdict boats arriving with illicit drugs and guns. We all know that this, th these islands are surrounded by water. That might not be easy. There's a, there's a lot of coastline here. But this is one of the areas that they are hoping because to because really and truly everyone believes that those guns that are being used in Cayman are coming here by boat. So that in, we want to work against the, the have an anti-gang strategy and I'll read from here. Equip the RCIPS with training and other resources to fight the gang lifestyle and provide misdirected youth with alternative programs, including training and employment. What I'd like to say is, thank you. You work with someone who gets things done, and not just promise to get it done. Okay. Um, we have a, a f another question on crime. What new policies or actions would you recommend in order to reduce violent crime? And how can each community assist in this process? Mr. Rivers, that question was to you. Thank you. A new policy to address crime, uh, three strikes and you're out kind of policy should be implemented. When you have habitual criminals perpetrating your communities, wreaking havoc on innocent and good people, there should be zero tolerance to that. When an individual or individuals continuously lean on the system because prison is no deterrent to them, then prison should be their final destination. Why should we, as honest, upright, hardworking citizens of this country who dream and aspire and have the desire to do, to, to reach success, why should we be prisoners in our own home, in our own communities, in our own districts? Zero tolerance to crime. Create a policy of three strikes and you're out, out of the community. If you can't behave, then there's a place for you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rivers. Ms. Orette, same question to you. What new, what new policies or actions would you recommend in order to reduce violent crime, and how can each community assist in this process? One of the key issues, as I see it, and one of the reasons why I feel that I need to be sitting as a member of the House of Assembly and working with a government such as the progressives who want to get things done is because for decades we've had promises and failed promises. With children, at-risk children, one of the things that I'd like to do is to focus not, of course, the, the police department and other law enforcement agencies have to work with the crime we have today. But if we can save today's generation, if you can put plans in place, initiate those plans, work with individuals within the community to save today's children. We are going to ensure that going forward, we have less and less crime. Additionally, when you save a child from a life of crime, it isn't just a matter of saving him from having to go to a, a, the, a Bonaventure house or in the case of the girl's home. 
What I see here is that there has to be a community effort between parents, uh, the church, social workers, the police, and all, so that we put programs in place to save the generation now. Not only will it save a child, we are ensuring that less and less of our citizens, our young citizens, end up in prison where government has to pay for them. But more than that, we need those same children to be contributing to today's society in a positive manner, and this is a subject that needs to be looked at immediately. Thank you, Ms. Arette. And Mr. Bush, same question. What new policies or actions would you recommend in order to reduce violent crime, and how can each community assist in this process? Thank you. I think I will repeat my, part of my answers I said earlier. We, we do have to work with our police service. The police is, are the element that must deal with crime. So we will develop policies to support the Royal Police Service in the achievement of its objective to uphold the law fairly and firmly to prevent and to detect crime. Now, when you come to serious crime, for far too many years, myself and others have fought in the legislature, fought against the UK's plan of action in crime. And it seems to me that they have this policy where they, to their own detriment, have mollycoddled criminal activity to the extent that they moved from, for murder, they moved from hanging to 25 years. And then they went from 25 years down to 12. And now I don't know where it is, except that I certainly told them they didn't have my support on that. But if the criminal is not scared of something then what's going to happen? We, we, they don't, our police don't carry guns. Just a couple of nights ago, I foolishly chased one that, that came to my door, and, and he must have thought I was asleep. He didn't know where I was when I hollered at him, and I was foolish to run after him. <laughs> but that's how brave they are. And, and so what are we doing as a community? The police is responsible. The police service is in the hands of the governor and, and the Chamber of Commerce needs to put your foot down instead of putting it down on some of these things, put it down on that. Get the governor to do their job and the UK to do their job and making the police service much more effective and some of the policies that are overflowed from Europe that they have to abide by, which they are now pushed on us, is weakening us as an overseas territory. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Um, at this stage, we actually had, oh, I had another question um, for the candidates, but we've, we've taken during the breaks um, some questions from the audience, and two of them here I'll combine together because I think they're very, very applicable. Um, West Bay has the highest crime levels in the country. How would you address this? And then this one is, it's kind of very similar. What will you, if elected, do about the gangs and the increase in crime in West Bay? And that question goes to Ms. Arette first. So I'll just repeat it so everybody. West Bay has the highest crime levels in the country. And what will you do, if elected, do about the gangs and the increase in crime in West Bay? Thank you. That's a sad indictment that we have the greatest crime rate in, in the country. I am not sure that anyone who sits in the Legislative Assembly should be far removed from his, con his or her constituents. When elected, I see my role as being very much involved on a day-to-day -ba -day basis in monitoring what is taking place in my community. I can't do that by always flying over the world or staying in some five-star hotel. I need to be here. People need to be able to find me in my office, or at least I need to find 
right now, there are very few people in West Bay that I could not stand up and speak with and talk with, even if those young men or women have been involved in gang-related activity. You cannot be far removed from your constituents. You need to be there. You need to let them know you care. You need young men and women to know that you're going to do everything possible in the Legislative Assembly to make life for them as, as a track within the community so they'll find uh, employment and they'll find um, their place in, in society where they can make a contribution, positive contribution. A, a politician needs to be involved. It may not be a very, uh, sometimes it's a thankless job, but it's rewarding when you see things happen. I know. I did it. I wonder what clap. Thank you. Same question, Mr. Bush. West Bay has the highest crime levels in the country. What will you do if elected about the gangs and the increase in crime in West Bay? Well, I'm not sure that West Bay has the highest one. I like to know where the statistic came from. Well, but but I, will, I will say this, that at times criminal crime and criminal activity takes place on Seven Mile Beach. When it is good on Seven Mile Beach, or it is Seven Mile Beach, and when something bad happens, it's West Bay Road. Anyway, Certainly, I don't think that as a representative we have been removed from any constituent except for those that will knock you down and don't speak to you. But certainly, I certainly believe that we have to have that community development program that strikes at all the avenues, family issues, Caymanian families that are falling through the cracks whether it is whatever part of West Bay it is, we need those community development committees so that they can deal with the problems in the district. That's what my government planned to do. We, we did it, they cut it out, but it's, it was doing some good, and I believe that if we do not put those kind of programs back, where policing is insured, where there's more collaboration, with the police service, where there is more collaboration with the school, where there is more collaboration with social services and family services as such, those things need to be happening at the community level. That's, the, that's where we're going to stop the, the, the criminal active after school care programs. That's where we're going to stop the gangs. But as long as, as, as I said, it is centralized in Georgetown, where silos are built up and people are standing in long lines day after day just to go get money, where are the programs? Where are they? Thank you, Mr. Bush and Mr. Rivers. According to the audience questions, West Bay has the highest crime levels in the country. What would you do if elected about the gangs and the increase in crime in West Bay? Well, gangs are derivative of socially social conditions uh, when you put people on welfare able-bodied people that is on welfare and they have no sense of self-worth no hope no desire don't know what it is to dream to achieve something then gangs is a derivative of that it all boils down and all stems from political manipulation to gain loyalty in a sense that equates to crime. What we should do as a community, as a people, as a government, a caring community, we should employ the efforts of our foreign counterparts who have experience in gang activity. Gang activity is relatively new here in the Cayman Islands. So we have no local gang experts, to my knowledge, on rehabilitating gangsters. The best way to rehabilitate them is to get in the professionals, rehabilitate them properly, whether it's mentoring, mentoring and employment, 
seek out the root cause of the problem why youths are killing youths aimlessly. Get to the root cause of it. You cannot erase or eradicate any problem until you know the root of it. We have poured millions of dollars on crime. We have uh, poured out thousands and thousands of man hours on trying to eradicate crime, but we have failed because we haven't got to the root cause of it. In order to eliminate crime and reduce it to a greater degree, we have to employ the next generation. We have to employ their parents. We have to give them a sense of worth, give them a direction to follow. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. <clears throat> We're going to take a short commercial break, but when we come back, we'll get into the subject of labor relations right after these messages. This is the progressive launch. Alden speaking, Marco speaking, Maxine Mosley and Pantan speaking. One big meeting, one big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out. Alden speaking, Marco speaking, Maxine Mosley and Pantan speaking. One big meeting, one big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out. This is the progressive launch. Progressive launch. Progressive launch. Progressive launch. This is the progressive launch. One big meeting. One big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out. Progressive launch. You might not often see us, yet we're always passing through, hidden in the background of everything you do. Who are we? We're Home Gas. The Clear Choice. Welcome back to the Sir John A. Cumber Primary School in the District of West Bay. We have three of the candidates for West Bay West. We're now moving on to the subject of labor and employment. As Will says, we're now on labor matters, and the first question is to Mr. Bush. Candidate, candidates in previous forums have suggested establishing a human resources authority. The question is, would you support removing the responsibility of processing work permit applications from the Immigration Department and creating a human resources authority? It is addressed in our manifesto, and I certainly we are proposing to do that. For far too long we've been talking about it, and it is just confusion, manipulation, people using the Department of Immigration for personal reasons. So there, is, there has to be come a time in our development that there has to be that kind of separation. So that we, we, immigration must be about that, must not be about labor in, entirely, while it has some play with it because we have so many work permits and has always had a high ratio of work permits. And certainly, I believe that setting it up, separate ministries, immigration will belong to home affairs, labor will be labor, 
and therefore human resources and all that goes with it would be separate and managed separately, and I believe better control would be had of it. So yes, as I said, it's in our manifesto. Thank you, Mr. Bush. <laughs> Mr. Rivers, same question to yourself. Would you support removing the responsibility of processing work permit applications from the Immigration Department and creating a human resources authority? I would support the removal of work permits from immigration. I think the Labour, the labor Minister should have a, an authority to overlook the work permit situation because what's happening in Cayman is that one, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing and by the time it's found out, it's way too late for the poor Caymanian who's looking for a job. Immigration should be about border control, mainly. Um, the Labour Minister should have an oversight committee or authority to scrutinize and, and balance who's looking for a permit, the qualifications of the individual who's looking for a permit versus those of us who's seeking to get a job in the labor force, in the workforce here. Because when we use work permits as a source of revenue, that's directly what's affecting us now. That's what's increasing our social services burden. It makes no sense, in my opinion, to gain millions of dollars from work permits, and then you spend that times two on social issues. Social deterioration takes place. You lose the whole community spirit, and, and we're turned upside down. You know, no hope, no desire. People are hopeless and helpless. Then when we get crime, really and truly, what do we expect? What do we expect? Immigration needs to handle border control, not work permits. Work permits should be a thing of the past. We should be aiming to decrease work permits annually. How can we empower our people when we have a roadblock with a work permit in front of them to seek employment? How can they dream and have desire? When the parents can't get a job, how can the children be inspired? You, you act as you live. If you live in a, a squalor, in a... In, in poverty, you're going to have a poor mindset. We have to eradicate that and erase that. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. And Ms. Soret, would you support removing the responsibility of processing work permit applications from the Immigration Department and creating a human resources authority? I think that immigration... The Immigration Department should deal with immigration. Border control, monitoring those who travel in and out of the country, and anything that has to do with immigration. There should be a, a Department of Labor which deals with labor, who should work hand in hand with uh, uh, offices such as the uh, the NWDA and um, you know the needs assessment unit, all of these are working together to try to see if they can assist Caymanians with the problem of unemployment. The one thing that all of us need to understand is that one of the greatest setbacks and something which will, we will feel it for the rest of history is was it is the status grant which took place in 2003. When we gave those individuals, close to 4,000, I understand, who brought dependents such as elderly parents and children, some even adopted uh, children of, of, of uh, family, and brought those in. It impacted not only our schools, not only our social services department or health services, but 14 years later, those who came here as little children are now in the workforce. They are also competing for the jobs which Caymanians would normally have. This is why when you're looking for individuals who you're going to ele elect to the Legislative Assembly, they must be individuals who go there for love of country, not selfish reasons. The employment situation is affected 
but this government has done much and we, we hope to continue to do more and I hope to be a part of it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was wondering, Mr. Moderator, if that is the reason why we still have over 19 or 20,000 work permits. Okay, well, let us move Let's on. Let's move on to the next question, please. So um, I'm actually going to jump ahead. We had a number of issues between this, but we're going to jump ahead to tourism because there's three different um, questions from the audience tonight in relation uh, to this. So um, this is going to be uh, Mr. Rett, Mr. Bush, and Mr. Rivers in that order. This question is in two parts in relation to tourism. Would you support the construction of another major hotel and would you support the granting of a casino or gaming license in an effort to diversify the tourism sector? Second part of the question first. I'm not sure that we need a casino license. I personally would not recommend it nor support it because I think this island offers enough to attract uh, tourists to this country without having a license to operate gambling casinos. Um, secondly, as far as the new hotel, I think the first part of the question, yes, de depending on what we're seeing as far as numbers of the tourists who want to visit here, I don't have a problem with it, uh, a new hotel, but I'm not too sure that we need to see uh, more crowding in, in the Seven Mile Beach area. There, there, there are other nice areas going east, and of course we, we're thinking about West Bay at this point in time, but there is definitely, um, we've had a, um, increase in the numbers of tourists that are coming here. We know that the two main pillars of our economy, one being the financial services industry, the second is tourism. So there has to be this ongoing uh, you, you know, consideration where we, we want to know, we don't want to have overcrowding, but on the other hand, we need to ensure that we find employment for Caymanians. Is that my first or second bell? Your first. My first. Okay, quickly to say that when it comes to work permits, those status grant holders also have every right to apply for work permits just as the other Caymanians do. Thank you, Mr. Rett. Mr. Bush, same question in two parts. Would you support the construction of another major hotel and B, would you support the granting of a casino or a gaming license in order to diversify the tourism sector? I'm not sure either that we need a casino license to enhance tourism. There is no imperative evidence that says so. So that is not where we would go. But there, do, there is need for enhancement of, of tourism. When it comes to hotels, I do believe that there needs to be a good mix. I certainly supported the Ritz. Well, the PPM didn't, but they went down there. Um, I certainly support the new one. The PPM didn't, but they went down there. But that goes all the way back to the Hyatt. Some of them didn't support that either. We do need to enhance our tourism product with upscale tourism. The present hotel do it, Ritz has done it, and they have encouraged the other hotels, Marriott and Weston, to continuously now upgrade. And I believe the new plans to do the other hotel are good plans. I certainly support that. I don't support tearing up everything to do so, but certainly I agree that we do need a Four Seasons, and after that, you'll need something else. I, we have put, we put forward the Tourism Hospitality Training School. We put that forward, and our children are going, 
and they are getting more interested now in training in, in the industry. And of course, tourism is not going to slow down unless something drastic happens within the country. It's not going to slow down. We need to prepare ourselves for it to be more welcoming for it and continue to be more welcoming. That's where we started. We will continue for a long time. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Mr. Rivers, the question again in two parts. Would you support the construction of another major hotel? And B, would you support the granting of a casino or gaming license in order to diversify the tourism sector? Thank you for the question. I think that another major hotel is necessary, but not in the immediate future. What is necessary is to have Caymanian faces in a place of employment in those places that already exist. What are we doing with the schools? Who better to give the Cayman experience than Caymanians? We have given up far too much in the name of development and has got far too little in terms of Caymanian employment in these establishments now. <laughs> what we have to ensure that when these establishments open up, like I said earlier, that our Caymanian faces and hands are the ones who smile at the guests and open the doors to welcome them. We also have to establish a wage in the tourism sector where salaries match the cost of inflation. 25, 35 years ago, we were making what we're making now, but the cost of living has skyrocketed since. That's why we don't have anyone gung-ho about being in the tourism industry. It has to make sense. It's simple, folks. If it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. It has to make dollars for us, the Cayman people. One of my greatest cries and disappointment in being in the tourism industry, and I took a little company from scratch, and it's international noon now, so I work in the tourism industry every day. It's an accomplishment that I'm very, very proud of. I have chased the Cayman dream, and I've become very successful in doing it, and I make no apologies for it, because I work long, long, tireless hours for my accomplishments. But one of my most disappointing moments in my success is to hear my guests ask me, where are the Cayman people in the tourism industry? That's something that I will and intend to change. I have the desire and the fortitude to change that. Don't get it twisted. Um, I, I think we're going to ask, we're probably going to ask one more question from our prepared questions and, and from our membership and um, from the public, and then we'll get on to the questions from the audience this evening. Um, this has got to do with political differences, and um, this one is, for, is going to be Mr. Bush, Mr. Rivers, and Ms. Oren. If elected, what steps would you take to ensure cooperative and focused action with all the other elected representatives for the betterment of our islands? Sorry, sir, you're going to have to okay. repeat that. If elected, what steps would you take to ensure cooperative and focused action with all the other elected representatives for the betterment of our islands? I believe in the party system. For the sake of organization, I do not believe that there should not be persons who have their own individuality, that they can't speak up, that they can't take different positions. I don't believe that. I believe in party system for the sake of organization, and particularly so under the present constitution. If elected, and whomever else is elected, we have to work with them. I took a position that I was not going to be the kind of opposition that I had to endure with. And nobody had to ask if I could have been on the street every day. There's enough reasons to. But I didn't do that. I tried to work with the government, even though they would hit me in the face with a mortar pestle. If you don't know what that is, I'll tell you about it later on. <laughs> every time. But I still stood my ground, done what I thought was necessary for the people of this island, 
and did it in a fashion that did not disrupt the government's program. I gave them the widest berth. I tried to work with them on, on the most important bills, and we were successful. And I must say this myself, Mr. Eden, and sometimes Mr. Tibbetts would join in, but he was part of the cabinet and, and bound by collective responsibility. And that is what needs to happen. I never did support the present system. I always wanted a committee system where people worked in, in committees, they, that committee had a, a president, and yes, you had opposition, but I, if I'm on record as saying no, the, we are too adversarial, we are too small, and you can hear it here tonight. Mm -hmm. The pointing the fingers and, and, the, and, the, and, and the need to try to batter you. We haven't gotten anywhere because of that type of legislative assembly. I hope that this time it will change. Okay. Mr. Rivers, same question. If elected, what steps would you take to ensure cooperative and focused action with all the other elected representatives for the betterment of our islands? Thank you for that. If elected, first we have to realize that we were elected by the people, for the people, to act on the people's behalf. Yeah. So no matter who we are elected alongside of or with, we have to come together to work for the best for the country, no matter the demographic that we hail from, the district, or the island. We have to form a cohesion. We have to think long term, not just four years, not just the next election. We have to, in my mind, I have a four, eight, 12, and 16 year plan that we have to embark on. And we have to have everyone on board with the idea of success for our Cayman people. Short-term thinkers don't create any results. The bickering and the fighting has got us where we're at. We have to remember as a country, as a people, as a community, we're on home soil fighting against probably about 130 different nationalities for our piece of the Cayman dream, which is a total shame, in my opinion. A total shame. But that's when we place emphasis on creating revenue from work permits. That again, I will reemphasize, has to be a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. So what I would be searching for and endorsing is more cohesion. But at the same point, we need to have some sort of opposition to keep government itself in check and in line. We, we have to have a sense of direction for what's best for our people, the Cayman people. I'm all for development, but we, the Cayman citizens, whether born or otherwise, have to be the beneficiaries of the development. If not, it doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Ms. Orette, if elected, what steps would you take to ensure cooperative and focused action with all the other elected representatives for the betterment of our islands. The Cayman Islands is a small country. Uh, when, we, we, when we choose to do something for one area, it affects every other area. So the representative needs to understand that they have to come together. Each of us have our own individual minds. We have certain, each of us decide, well, I think, you know, we, we we, we don't all think alike all the time. But once we've come together and there isn't one person who thinks he knows it all or she knows it all, when it has to be my way or the highway, we run into trouble. When you have individuals who think, is this our top priority? Is this what we should do now? We need all these things, but what do we do first? When you have people who understand finance, such as our present uh, Minister of Finance, Mr. Marco Archer, who is as, as good as you can get anywhere. You will find that when you work with other experienced, educated, dedicated people, you can get things done. Getting into the house and making a lot of noise and arguing across the aisle, sometimes to, to actually, it becomes embarrassing we need to understand there's no time to waste. Get in there, work with individuals, 
we'll come to uh, the majority will rule and certain things have to be put on hold, put on the back burner for a while, but you get in there and you work with everyone because what is important is that we understand we're doing all this for love of our country and not for what we individually want. Thank you, Ms. Arendt. Well, thank you. We've gone through several questions. Now we're going to have one final round of some questions from the audience, and then after that, the closing remarks. We'll be right back with this short commercial break. The world is getting smaller. We travel more. We see more. We do more. So you need a bigger health plan like Premier Health. You have easy access to benefits at home. One million U.S. providers accept your ID card for college, vacation, and business travel. With 24-7 worldwide assistance, U.S. pharmacy benefits, and 96% of claims settled in five days, Premier Health offers you the care you deserve. Brit K, where people come first. BritK.ky this is the progressive launch. Alden speaking, Marco speaking, Maxine Mosley and Pantan speaking. One big meeting, one big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out. Alden speaking, Marco speaking, Maxine Mosley and Pantan speaking. One big meeting, one big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch. Everybody going come out, progressive launch, come out, progressive launch, come out. This is the progressive launch. Progressive launch. Progressive launch. Progressive launch. This is the progressive launch. One big meeting. One big meeting on this weekend. Everybody going come out. Progressive launch. C3 Pure Fiber broke the Caymanian record of the first 100% fiber optic network. Do you know what it feels like to be fiber fast? It feels like this, like your whole life passing beneath your fingertips, like your world is living with you, like everything in your whole life is always connected. We are a new breed of connectivity, and we are ready for you. TV from 59, internet from 69, bundles from 89, and home phone from 9. Join us today, 333-3333 or c3.ky. Welcome back to the Sir John A. Cumber Primary School in West Bay. We are at that stage where we have our final audience question. Um, we have 20 questions here on the table uh, and some very, very good questions, so thank you for that. Four questions from the audience tonight relates to drugs. Um, so I'll, I'll, one statement is, what will be done about the drug dealers in West Bay? And the question, I guess, is, and this question is going to Mr. Rivers first. Drugs are used by students in our secondary school. What is your solution to reaching a zero tolerance to drugs? First of all, any student that is caught with drugs, there's been a lot of students who had their lives ruined by the results of a positive urine test that put them in a terrible situation. We were all young once and we were all finding ourselves. No student should get a life sentence for smoking a little bit of weed. Not that it's right, but they should be sentenced to death or sentenced to failure by, by making a simple mistake. Mentoring to them, putting them in a rehabilitation program, and enhancing their opportunities, showing them a better way, a, a different direction, is what's, what needs to be done in those circumstances and situations. Being too harsh on them is just not the answer. Kids need a lot of mentoring too. They come from troubled homes sometimes. They're influenced by their peers. They're subjected to a negative environment. There are many reasons why kids go on drugs. To crucify them is not the answer. To incarcerate them in Northwood prison is not the answer. Many kids have went to Northward for 
simple little petty crimes and picked up drugs in prison. Our system has to be more strict on our institutions that drugs, if you, if you burn weed, you must smell it. How can it be burning northward and no one smells it? Who, where are the security guards? How does it get in? You know? We, we have to stop penalizing the user exclusively and deal with the source, the drug dealers, the importation of it, those who create the more heinous crimes. When you have a drug pusher, they, they can kill a generation. Why crucify one drug user for a simple crime? Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Ms. Orette, same question. Um, what will be done about the drug dealers in West Bay and drugs are used by students in our secondary schools. What is your solution to reaching a zero tolerance to drugs? I think, as I mentioned earlier on, we need to work with the children within, certainly at the primary school level. One of the things that I'd like to do when elected is to work with uh, parents, and the wider community. There are many retirees and older individuals who can work with after school programs. For instance, I'm thinking right now of, of Wesleyan Christian Academy. If one goes to that school, you'll see a number of cabinets. They've, they've run out of space and have to add more cabinets to to house all of the awards and trophies and everything they get when they go overseas and compete in different areas, particularly in music. The, once many of them have found very, very good positions in the, in the private sector, they, those, those gifts and talents which they've had in music are basically laying dormant. If those individuals are used after school, instead of children going home on a bus without supervision, if there are programs in place where someone gives even two hours a month, and we have hundreds of people who can do that, not just retirees, but young people who, to, in, in collaboration with their employer, can help to guide these children into it, doing things other than on a cell phone or out doing something else. We want to improve all of the sporting facilities that we have in West Bay, where we don't, our children wouldn't have to get up early in the morning to go to train for swimming. We'll have it in West Bay. We'll have sporting facilities. Not every child wants to be a soccer player. Volleyball, basketball, so, um, cricket, whatever. We need to get to harness them now, and that will make a big dent. Thank you. Mr. Bush, question to you. What will be done about the drug dealers in West Bay and drugs are used by students in our secondary schools? What is your solution to reaching a zero tolerance to drugs in schools? Firstly, we do have a zero tolerance, and I believe in it, to, dr to drug usage. I am in no shape or form going to sit in any audience or any legislative assembly and do otherwise. Because I grew up in a West Bay that didn't have it, and when it seeped in here, some of the paragons of virtue that want to accuse people today about wrongdoing were some of them that were passing it around to young people. And the young people are now adults in this district. And when Mikiwa Bush and others stood there in the 80s and the early 90s and said, this is wrong, we were against it. Oh, you don't know how much opposition, and they're still opposing me. You heard mentioned just now about drug urine tests. Well, a story is going around this district that I put it in place. You see where it was put? This is the law. 1973. I wasn't even thinking about getting into the legislative assembly. That's when that was put in force. So some of them in this audience tonight who's running around this district telling people that I put it, and they even said Daphne was part of it, but when we got elected, that was done in play. Was it the right thing? Well, is it wrong to test 
people when they're driving and they kill somebody? Is it wrong then? No. Programs were not put in place from back then. That's the problem. And some of the parental responsibilities did not exist. They were no-nos. Today, we are paying. Now we have to start to work with the younger ones and make sure, again, I believe that our community development action committees that we are proposing holds out the best way to arrest the problems of drug usage. And the police are going to have to deal with the serious drug criminals because I don't know how legislators can do it except to make more laws. And we don't need more laws. We need programs. Thank you. I'd like to thank the audience for the very provocative questions that you've posed. It's now that time where we have to move to closing remarks, and we'll begin as the questions were posed with the McKeever Bush to begin. Closing, closing remarks. Oh. Come to that point already? <laughs> We're just, just starting to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> we're just getting warmed up. Yeah, we're just getting warmed up. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Chamber, for bringing this forum here this evening. And I must thank, tell you that I've never ever felt so free in a Chamber forum before than I felt here tonight. <laughs> but I, I do want to thank you all for being what I thought was very fair. And certainly to thank all the sponsors for a allowing this to happen. I think some good information got out all around, except for those that, you know, try to take a slap at me. That's okay. I'm the longest serving one. I, I like Lee Kuan Yew. I like Singapore. I like Lee Kuan Yew thought processes. A small country can be developed, can maintain and even grow its cultural norms and protect its heritage while not discriminating, but being very inclusive. We can build a nation by educating, firstly, strong educational programs, by educating our people and allowing the country to grow so that our people can prosper in the present and future. I don't know where we're going to get all that I am here and talk about if we don't grow. All the things that all the candidates want, 60-something people running now for office and everybody wanting something else and more and more, but they don't want nothing to change. How will that happen? How? To get those things, it takes political will and scrapping the jealousy and small-mindedness that provides our country. We need to stop it, Caymanians. We can't get ahead. We are going to starve to death much more than we are by what we are doing and going along right now. Laugh if you may. The facts are the facts, though. Thank you very much. Mr. Paul Rivers. Thank you, Will. Thank you, audience here. Thank you, audience home. Thank you, radio audience. And thank the good Lord Almighty that we had a very peaceful chamber forum we can be at one in West Bay. It's evident. First, I'd like to say, you know, I want to, for us to recollect 2012. By referendum, we created an exercise that we are part of now. This, first, this election is the first from that exercise for more accountability. We created the one man, one vote, single member constituency. The reason why we created, we imp implemented that system was because we had a lack of accountability in previous years. Whom did we have a lack of accountability from? It was the part of system, outright straight, and make no bones about it. <laughs> if we go forward as a country and elect a part of led government, we're gonna be shooting ourselves in the head. We're gonna be doing exact, we're gonna be endorsing and, and re-implementing exactly what we're running from accountability. Independent candidates bring independent views and independent direction to the round table of discussion. Just think of it like this. Many of us come from professional backgrounds and we have to go into boardrooms to interact and consult with our counterparts of whom we may not have known, but we did it for best of company. Independent candidates can do it for best of country. 
when we have a party-led government, the people get left behind. It is evident of that. That's why we come down to single-member constituencies in one man, one vote, to have more accountability. You will have more accountability with independent candidates like myself. I'm not afraid to take a stand, no matter what it is. My stand is to eliminate and eradicate political manipulation to create a better future for all of us. Thank you. Thank God. Ms. Daphne Orrett. Thank you very much, sir. We are all here for one reason, I think, is to determine who perhaps should be the person returned to the House of Assembly for West Bay West. We need to understand that these few minutes or these past couple hours at this desk is not who we are all about. I've lived here in this district and you all know who I am. I bring with me, I'm the more, most senior of the three, but God has blessed me with very good health, a very sharp mental capability, strong emotionally, committed, experienced, educated. I've gone from a teacher at 14 years of age to executive officer in the government department. I've managed condominiums, and I can tell you right now, there are individuals who have said they've never worked for a better boss. I've taught Sunday school for over four decades, but I love people. I care for people. I'm not an individual who wants to seek this seat because it's not always the easy road, but it is necessary. And I'm saying to you tonight, when you return someone to the House of Assembly, number one, they need, you need to know that they're going to be there to carry out what is best for the country. You need to return individuals who know what they're doing. You do not put someone to handle finance who knows nothing about finance. And this is one of the reasons why the progressives government is as successful as they are. They have a group of people who Thank know what they're doing and are working for the betterment of Cayman. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the candidates as well as the audience. And now I turn to Paul Pearson for some closing remarks. On behalf, of the ch on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, President Kyle Broadhurst and the Chamber Council, I would like to extend a special thanks to the candidates for participating in tonight's event. Thank, Thank you. you. I know we have peppered you with questions this evening, but your answers have been extremely thoughtful and we thank you for your time. I would also like to thank all of you in the audience for attending and engaging us with us this evening, especially with all the questions. I would like to thank Hurley's Media for their support of the forums and for broadcasting tonight's event live. I would also like to thank our sponsoring sponsors, the DART organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holding, and Puritan Cleaners. The next candidates forum, which you're all invited to, will take place on Monday the 24th at the John Gray Memorial Church Hall. West Bay South candidates will be in attendance including John Jefferson Jr., Burns Rankin, Laura Young, and Tara Rivers. Thank you for supporting the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forums. Good night and safe travels. Thank you. God bless you. It matters to you. It matters to us. We're Cayman 27. Cayman Informed.